Welcome to this video lecture. This is Mark Scythian, FAA licensed aerospace technician, airframe, power plant, and avionics certified. The date today is September 16, 2016. In this video lecture, we are going to discuss airplane wing aspect ratio, wing loading, mean aerodynamic cord, and Reynolds number. We'll start first with defining what wing aspect ratio is. This is the ratio between the square of the wingspan divided into the wing's two-dimensional plan form wing area. So if you simply took the average cord of, let's say, a swept wing with a taper, there are different cord lengths throughout a taper wing and taking the mean cord which is the root cord plus the tip cord added together divided by two and then multiply times the span will yield the area of the wing two-dimensionally then if you take the wing span and square it and then divide it into the area you will end up with a wing aspect ratio with a rectangular wing, it's pretty much the mean cord is the same throughout. So that would just be the cord on a constant cord wing times the span for area, and then the wing span squared divided by the area to obtain wing aspect ratio. So mathematically, the aspect ratio is defined as the, swing, uh, the square of the wing span divided by the area. Also, with this formula, you can also solve for other variables such as the required wingspan or the required wing area if you're dealing with a performance chart with recommended wing loading and wing aspect ratios for certain aircraft development applications. So if you're deciding to build uh, model airplanes or even ultralight recreational experimental aircraft, uh, you might go by a wing loading chart for a specific type of aircraft airplane function and or the wing loading and recommended wing aspect ratios for such performance uh, capabilities that are desired and then uh, coming up with a recommended wing span and area based off wing loading and aspect ratio recommendations you can also use this algebraic uh, formulation to calculate the recommended wingspan and recommended area and then uh, use the aerodynamic wing lift formula to carry on the basic wing design but if you're dealing with uh, any type of wing out there you can know a lot about the characteristics of the flight performance by knowing the uh, classification of wing aspect ratio so graphically speaking a high aspect ratio wing is long and skinny, low aspect ratio wing is short and fat, and the moderate aspect ratio wing is kind of in between these two. So low aspect ratio wings, pros and cons, the pros are more tolerance to construction irregularities, higher payload and wing loading, more maneuverability, lower parasitic drag. The cons are requires high powered engine, poor or dangerous no power gliding, more fuel consumption, and greater induced drag. So the uh, tolerance to construction irregularities refers to the uh, allowance of structural errors and the construction across the wing because the wing itself is short and fat so uh, you can keep the airflow on the wing even with uh, structural irregularities. Now if the wing was long and skinny uh, like a high aspect ratio wing uh, you'd have less uh, of a tolerance for uh, construction irregularities and a higher likelihood of airflow separation on a high aspect wing uh, leading to partial stall of the wing during flight. So uh, it's easier to build a low aspect ratio wing but then you know, because of the high induced drag of the low aspect ratio wing, you're going to need 
a more powerful engine to overcome that induced drag. And uh, if we go and move on to the high aspect ratio weighing pros and cons, uh, the pros are requires much less power, excellent and much safer no power gliding, less fuel consumption, and lower induced drag. So of course you have a longer projection of the wing and so parasitic drag is going to be a little bit more of an issue uh, inherently on the surface or for uh, exposed rivets and whatnot. The cons are less tolerance to construction irregularities, lower payload and wing loading, less maneuverability, and greater parasitic drag. Medium aspect ratio wings take the moderation between these two extremes. The typical high wing aspect ratios run from 12 to 22, medium 7 to 10, and low 2 to 6. So your fighter jet would have a low wing aspect ratio and usually AR is around 4 to 5 uh, or as low as 2 to 3 so between 2.5 to 4 is your fighter jet. Uh, your high wing aspect ratios are like glider wings and they can go up to as high as 22 or even 30 to 1. Uh, we know the Predator drone is not so much a glider but it's got a glider type wing long and skinny and it's uh, aspect ratio is about 22 or 23, the MQR Reaper. And then, of course, you know, your ultralight gliders or your sailplanes are around 22 to 1. Uh, but uh, most uh, marketable airplanes that are common, even down to the Cessna 172 and all the way up to the airliners, usually run around 7 to 1. So they're kind of moderate wing aspect ratio and they take the uh, the best of both uh, extremes of wing aspect ratio and they incorporate it into a good design. So wing loading is the the force weight or the pounds weight divided into the area of the airplane either in pounds per square foot or kilograms per square meter wing loading. So uh, there's different wing loading applications for different flight characteristics. So uh, you know, if you're on ultralight, they could be as low as three pounds per square foot. Uh, if you most uh, conventional airplanes can run about ten to twelve pounds per square foot, then if you take like the 747, uh, especially when high lift devices are deployed, they can go as high as 250 pounds per square foot. And uh, so it's all about the flight performance and the uh, desired payload and uh, speeds involved that determine the wing loading uh, characteristics and recommendations. So you consult with uh, wing loading charts. So now if you move on to the Reynolds number, this is the ratio between a gas or liquid in motion or a fluid uh, ratio between its density to its inertia. A good example of what Reynolds number is uh, explaining the different functions of Reynolds number from laminar, transient, and turbulent flows is turning on a faucet in your sink to very low output flow, just a thin stream, almost the faucet shut off. So you have this very thin flowing stream and you can see through it, it's transparent. So obviously the Reynolds number is laminar because the flow of that thin water stream at low output is obviously very laminar. You can see right through it. But then when you start to increase the flow of the water to full output, you start to notice that the water is no longer transparent in the stream. It's getting cloudy and that would represent a very turbulent flow. So it's referring to the molecular activity of the flow of the flowing fluid in relationship to either the density or the inertia so at very low speed output of a fluid that has uh, no issues with irregularities in flow just taking the form of a vector you know like in one direction or over a surface at lower uh, speeds you're going to notice that the mo molecules are uh, not erratically 
interacting with each other they're going in density but as you increase that flow and length you can start to see that the molecules start to interact with each other in the flow stream in a turbulent manner and this starts to cloud that water now if we apply the same concept to airflow over a wing uh, you uh, the approximate uh, transient flow of the Reynolds number between laminar to turbulent is close to about 3,000, 2,500, let's say 3,000, 2,500 is textbook, to 2,500, 3,500, so uh, typically about 3,000 is the transient Reynolds number between laminar and turbulent, but anything above 3,000 will be a turbulent Reynolds number, anything below 3,000 to 2,500 will be laminar. So as the airflow approaches the leading edge of the wing, it starts out in a laminar flow, but then as it travels over the wing, it becomes more and more closer to transient, and then as more distance is accomplished towards the trailing edge of the wing, it will turn turbulent, just like the water flow going from low to high speeds, and you see that the water is no longer transparent, but it's cloudy that molecular activity within the flow stream starts to become erratic and then it turns turbulent. So very simple way to understand Reynolds number is that it is the ratio between the density and the inertia of the fluid. Now why this is so important for aeronautics and fluid dynamics is that when one is developing let's say a wing structure in a scale down manner uh, for a certain larger application, the function of the scale up or scale down is actually not the structural dimensions itself, but the proportions of air density and Reynolds number. So if you have a certain Reynolds number based off a certain air density and a certain flow length, you then have a change in the air density proportionally to understand what kind of dimension sizing will be required. So to define Reynolds, numbers math, uh, Reynolds number mathematically, it's simply the density of the air times the speed of the air times the length of the wing cord divided into the fluid viscosity of the given fluid. So using the metric system is ideal in these units here. So now you know the ratio between the variables. And the Reynolds number has no units. It's a coefficient. It is a dimensionless and unitless flow. So anything greater than 3000 uh, RE will be turbulent. So the real purpose of Reynolds number is the scale up and scale down proportions. So once you know the Reynolds number limit, you also know what the maximum flight capabilities are before the turbulence exceeds the boundary layer capabilities. So on previous videos you learned what boundary layers boundary layer represent. It's the aeroelasticity around the airplane wing in order to keep the air flow uh, on the wing so that the speed, airflow, and pressure differentials can take place. So on heavy airliners and fighter jets, the Reynolds number can be typically between 15 and 20 million at cruise flight. Lighter airplanes, about 48 million, and small remote control airplanes between 100,000 and 1 million. And it, again, it, uh, it depends on the air density, the length of the cord, and the speed that the aircraft is flying. And so knowing the maximum turbulent intermolecular flows can allow the uh, capabilities and limits of the aircraft to be established. So very important part of aeronautics, the Reynolds number, and on a basic level, it should just be understood as the molecular inertia or density of the fluid in motion and how the molecules either interact in cohesion or in turbulence with each other. This is the basic understanding of RE. Uh, Reynolds number itself is an extremely complicated subject. It can be an entire career just writing Reynolds number der derivations for flows, but this video is just a basic understanding that it is a ratio of the internal activity of the molecules of the fluid given 
and how that changes over speed and length of travel. It's really all you have to know regarding the RE if you're on the technical or operations level uh, and not the engineering level. So uh, we move on here next to the mean aerodynamic chord, which is not the mean chord, the average chord length, even though it's very close to it, but it's the, uh, it's the chord at which the center of lift will develop perpendicularly across that chord when at 30%. Why 30%? Because if you take a regular rectangular wing that is constant chord and no sweep, no taper, none of that, uh, the center of lift will always be 30% of the chord across. So with the right formulation of the mean aerodynamic chord for the given wing, using either long hand derivations, better yet software, or even better yet, the specifications for the manufacturer, always look for the mean aerodynamic chord, MAC, because then once you have that number, let's say this was a 10 foot center chord, and then the tip chord was, let's say, three and a half, uh, you couldn't just add these two and divide it into two to get the mean chord. You'd only do that for calculating the area of the wing. But if you wanted to know where this wing has a center lift in relationship to a rectangular wing, it's not so easy to just take the average chord and then go 30% across it. You couldn't do that. You'd get an error. But the mean aerodynamic chord would have to be known or calculated based off the wing type. Look for that specification. And then whatever it is, let's say it's listed MAC is some length, maybe like 6.8, like right here. I'm just making it up. But, you know, it's very close to the mean chord, but it is not exactly that, right? And close doesn't count in this game. So you need to know the exact MAC. So let's say... Uh, let's say the mean aerodynamic chord was somewhere like right here. We'll just arbitrate, maybe like 6.8 or something, right? So you take 30% of that 6.8 from the leading edge and then draw a perpendicular line across and you'd get some center of lift right across here, which is about right. The more you sweep back a wing, the farther back the center of lift occurs. Now a wing like this one, a rectangular wing, it's going to want to lift backwards because look, the center of lift is right here. So you're going to have to have more nose weight on that, that type of an airplane. But a swept back wing can literally fly without a tail because the outboard part of a swept back wing acts like a horizontal stabilizer. So you can put elevons on the outboard side to control both the roll and the pitch. Uh, it's a blend of both aileron and elevator without a tail, right? But a wing like this, because it's swept back, will want to lift forward. So obviously the MAC will be somewhere around here. Uh, there's also software calculators where you can enter dimensions and uh, environmental uh, data into the software and it will actually calculate your MAC. But it's so important to know that because then, you know, at 30% of the MAC, you can draw a line going across you find out the CG is right way back here, or the center of lift is actually right here. So your CG can be arranged around the center of lift. So you have a stable airplane within the weight and balance limits. So that's what mean aerodynamic chord represents. So rule of thumb, the mean aerodynamic chord, if you're at 30% of that MAC from the leading edge, towards the trailing edge, one, uh, 30, 0.3 of that. If you draw a perpendicular line across, that will be your center of lift of that given wing. So this is very helpful to pilots and aerospace technicians who are either setting weight and balance data for flight or making repairs on the wing as to keep the specifications within OEM limitations allowing for a correct repair. So basically everything I just said here is already written here and uh, kind of gave more of the abbreviated version, but uh, that covers the four important topics of wing aspect ratio, wing loading, mean aerodynamic cord, and Reynolds number.
Thank you for watching this video and have a great day.